All right, so welcome everyone and good evening to the Beaumont Children Investigation and Implications of Cold Cases held in the inaugural Social Sciences Week. So before we begin tonight's panel discussion, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to those elders who have walked before us. They hold the memories, traditions, culture and hopes of the Aboriginal peoples. In acknowledging country today, I also acknowledge that the sovereignty was never ceded by the Gadigal people. The social sciences are an imperative group of academic disciplines, including criminology, sociology, anthropology, accounting, linguistics, psychology, and social medicine, to just name a few. They play an important role in shaping the direction of the nation, contributing to knowledge um, on issues such as human rights, legislation, the national cu curriculum, climate change and superannuation. Social Sciences Week aims to encourage the discussion between academics, practitioners and the general public to showcase the diversity and relevance of social science research. So in the spirit of this event and in the spirit of Social Sciences Week, I encourage you to Google a social science um, or Google one of the social sciences, social scientists here tonight um, and have a look at what we do and have a look at what the social sciences contribute. So tonight is being live streamed to the Australian Sociological Association um, Facebook page. So um, I would like to acknowledge the support of Social, social Sciences Week Committee, the Australian Sociological Association, the University of Newcastle, and the Crime and Criminal Justice Association at the University of Newcastle for helping to bring this event together. Um, now, if you're on social media, if you could use the hashtag if you're tweeting um, SSW2018. So for those in the live audience, in the case of an emergency, please follow the directions of the University of Sydney, University of Newcastle Sydney staff and toilets are um, straight ahead and to the right. So tonight, our panel is made up of Dr. Xanthi Mallet, who joins us from the UK. So Xanthi is a criminologist and forensic scientist at the University of Newcastle. She worked with the Seven Networks Murder Uncovered team on the Beaumont children's disappearances in South Australia, as well as the Wanda Beach murderers in New South Wales. We also have Duncan McNabb. So Duncan is an award-winning investigative journalist and author of 10 non-fiction books, particularly on crime. He was a supervising producer of Seven Networks Murder Uncovered and worked on the Beaumont Children case for 12 months. And we have Dr. Ben Lohmeyer. So Ben is a critical youth sociologist and youth worker. He has over a decade of youth work experience in alternative education, accommodation and peace building. Um, and Ben is our resident Adelaidean. And then myself, my name is Joel McGregor. I'm an Associate Lecturer in Criminology at the University of Newcastle, um, and I'm moderating tonight's panel discussion. So tonight we'll go through the events of the day, um, the recent investigation, and then we will also be looking at the impact of the social sciences um, on this case, or how the social sciences can help um, understand the events within this case. So Duncan, I'm hoping that you can start us off um, and provide us with a short overview of the case and the disappearance of the Beaumont children. Let's go. Um, the Beaumont children, three kids, um, lived in a suburb called Somerton Park in Adelaide, uh, about 1.5 kilometres from Glenelg Beach. Um, 26th of January, I think it was a Wednesday from memory, they decide to go to the beach on their own. Not uncommon for them, they'd been down there before. Their father had actually followed them down a couple of times and made sure they were fine. It was a stinking hot day, around about 39 degrees Celsius. The beach was packed. Um, back in 1966, it wasn't a public holiday. They came later, you know, if I, my memory serves me. You have the Australia Day and then the public holiday would be tacked on the following weekend and on the Monday. So the kids would then head off to school the week after that to start the new school year. So pretty exciting time in Adelaide, full of people. The kids hop on the bus early morning around about 9 or 10. They head to the beach, they're due back at lunchtime or shortly thereafter. Their mother gives them a couple of shillings. It was a 
decimal currency came in around about three weeks after they disappeared. That was one after February, which I remember for some reason. That morning they are seen by the bus driver who remembers them. They're seen by the local postman who knows the three kids. Jane Beaumont, the eldest, is extremely responsible, um, incredibly trustworthy. Um, the kids go down to a um, part of the beach near a rotunda. They're seen playing on the beach. They're seen by an older couple chatting to a man, a um, tall, good-looking bloke, late 30s, early 40s, very presentable-looking. Um, they're later seen that afternoon. The last person, parking person to abduct them, who took them was a shop assistant. Um, and young Jane Beaumont had gone in with her siblings and she bought a couple of things from the local pie shop called Winsels. What was curious about that, what is memorable about that, because she left home with a couple of shillings in her hand, but when she paid for these pies, the shop assistant was quite certain that she paid with a fresh, crisp one pound note. A lot of money for a kid in those days, and that stuck in the shop assistant's mind. It's a fact the police held back for the first 12 months of the investigation. After that sighting, the kids just literally disappeared they have never ever been seen again. Um, that afternoon, Mrs. Beaumont is watching for the buses to come back, going increasingly frantic. Her husband comes home. He'd been away, as he's a sales representative, he'd curiously enough been in Snowtown, South Australia that same day. Um, he comes home, she's frantic, he searches the beaches, there's no sign of them. Early evening, he races down to the police station to report them missing. One of the young detectives that we played there with the video was one of the coppers that's still alive, a guy called Moston Matters, who was in his mid 80s by now. An example of a copper you'd like to get to know because the interview in his mid 80s, he still gives a damn, he still wants to find the children. He's driven his entire life to find them. And he's still in regular contact with Mr. Beaumont, who we've assumed to his early 90s. They still talk. Mrs. Beaumont's in a nursing home. Um, she doesn't remember what's about anything, but Mr. Beaumont is still up on money. He's on target all the time, so Moston kept in close contact with him, um, sort of shepherding through their lives, actually, making sure they're okay, um, making sure they're comfortable. Um, the police didn't react very quickly. The locals did the best they could. Back in those days, they would have needed a lot of assistance from the city um, for them to get it. So the first 20, 12 to 20, 24 hours, were not terribly well handled by the South Australian police. When they realised there was a massive problem coming their way, they finally reacted. So by the middle of the next day, the search was on. And, uh, there's plenty of media coverage, I think you'll see at some stage, looking for the kids, and they found absolutely nothing. It's the biggest manhunt in Australian history at the time. They searched beaches, they searched sand dunes. They eliminated the fact that kids may have had misadventure, either been drowned or a sand dune collapsing on them. But pretty quickly on they realised that the kids had been abducted. The curiosity about the abduction, one of many, is that abducting one child is not uncommon. Abducting two is unusual. Abducting three children simultaneously is virtually unheard of. I think Zambi and I have both had a long look for similar cases and there isn't one. Abducting three small children is incredibly complicated most unusual and required someone who was very capable of doing it too. Maybe a degree of planning, who knows. And that's the last we saw of the Beaumonts. Um, for years following there have been all manner of sightings. Uh, there was a, a Dutch clairvoyant had a vision and he came out and captivated Australia. In fact, a crowd at the airport for his arrival was bigger than that of the Beatles in those days. Uh, he, of course, had made a loop, complete fraud. Um, one other detective became obsessed by it and chased them for years and thought he found the Beaumonts in various places, including New Zealand, the USA, and in Canberra. That was, of course, all completely wrong as well. But he kept trying. Um, he even, and at one stage, the poor family, about a year into it, started getting letters saying, I've got the children, I'm going to bring them back, meet me somewhere. And that was all, of course, fraud as well, just torture the poor bug a little bit more. Their marriage collapsed. Uh, they've been living apart now for probably about the last 50 odd years almost. But bizarrely, they're both living very, very close to where the children disappeared. Um, and Mr. Beaumont, not so long ago, when asked why, 
she said, it's because they might come home again. So that's a short story to Beaumont. It's still a case unsolved. There are, as we, when we're tracing it, we believe we found the most likely culprit for it. There have been a lot of suspects over the years. And anyone who sort of makes bad Adelaide jokes is most of do at some stage. Adelaide has a, a quite sinister reputation, which you may not deserve. Um, but the number of suspects have been fast. Anyone perhaps studied Adelaide, there's a suggestion that the culprit might have been the person responsible for the two girls abducted from the Adelaide Oval in the early 70s. Unlikely. Um, suggested that they were taken by the people involved in what in Adelaide is called the family. And the family was this group of sinister, well-to-do, well-connected men uh, allegedly scooping children off the streets. Um, it's highly unlikely as well. I think, for me, the simplest, uh, which is the result we ended up with, was that they were taken by a very capable, very persuasive man. Um, and when Harry Phipps popped up into our lives, as a result, curiously enough, of a book that was published some years ago, um, and a person came forward who was extraordinarily credible and said, this man is my father in law you should look into him. Um, and a couple of amateurs, I think, who did a great job, committed to finding out the real truth about the Beaumonts, and it was with their extraordinary assistance that we got involved as well, and put together the TV special that was up earlier this year, Harry Phipps remains and will always be, in my view, the clear suspect of the Beaumont kidnapping. The sad thing is we don't know what he did with the kids. He had a particularly good idea of what he did with them, but it didn't work out. Um, I still think there are a number of places we'd love to have a look at if the police could be persuaded, which would be the cast on the factory that some of you may have seen that escalated earlier this year, um, and possibly upsetting the current owners of Harry's house by sending the police to have a good forensic look around that carpool and the cellar in the house. Phipps, just as a bit of background, was um, a well-to-do anti-South Australian industrialist, beautifully connected with politics, policing, um, worth vast amounts of money, and lived, we were just chatting about this earlier, Harry lived in a house adjacent to Glenelg Beach. And it's quite a, I'm reading something, here, it's quite a sinister looking house. Everything around Glenelg is sort of big and beachy and open and friendly. You get to Harry's place and it's this very large, sprawling house with a huge, deep roof. In the roof there's an attic with attic windows. Under the floor is a basement. And the house has got a big veranda around it. It's almost as though it's peering at you through a little slit in the Venetian blinds. It's a very unusual looking house. But you stand on the corner of Harry's house and 150 metres that way is the rotunda where the kids were seen with a man who matches Harry's description. 150 metres in the other direction is the pie shop where the kids were seen with their crisp one pound mug. Geography often plays a major role in investigations. People tend to operate in areas they feel comfortable with. Um, so when I was standing there, I'm thinking, this is really working quite nicely. This man has got to be able to grab the three kids quickly, woo them to a secure place, and do whatever he did with them. Uh, that requires, I think, the geography that he's familiar with. He's got to know the place, he's got to know how the place feels and operates, how the beach operates, how he could actually take three kids from the beach and take them back somewhere. If you grabbed hold of three kids and tried to bundle them unwillingly into your car, everyone would notice. But if you lure them back to your house, which is close to everything, it looks completely natural. And it's the simplicity, I suppose, when you're dealing with old crimes and you're dealing with new crimes, the simplicity is what should drive you. The chronology of how it happens, <coughs> but the simplicity. We can we quite often chat to people about crime, you get these magnificent conspiracy theories. But for me, it's always the simple things. Go back to the chronology, follow the timeline, look at the geography, and take the simple route. And if you eliminate the simple route, by all means, look at something more complicated, but keep it simple. Um, don't try to perfect something. Yeah. So, um Duncan, you named Harry Phipps there, and I'm going to turn to Xanthi now. Xanthi, in the Seven Network report, um, you said that the offender was likely to have gained um, the children's control, um, and you said that this was an issue of power and control. So the offender, you said, would have been charismatic, confident, and lacked empathy. 
So can you give some more information about the possible offender who would be able to, as Duncan said, take three children? <clears throat> well, I think what would concern me say he was a very confident individual. If you think about what Duncan mentioned earlier, taking one child is not unusual. Two is, is, is very rare. Three is unheard of. But this tells you somebody is very confident, uh, very capable of coercing these three children because Duncan's absolutely right that the children weren't forced into the car, um, you know, under duress. They were coerced wherever they went to that house likely, or whether they got into a vehicle. So this is somebody who's very comfortable around children, probably very skilled through practice at coercing them. And then, you know, they've got to be very confident that they can pull this off. So they've got to be planned, they're intelligent, they lack empathy because they're, you know, abducting three children. Um, so, yes, and probably extremely charismatic that they can charm those children and put anyone else's mind at ease as well. So certainly it, the situation tells you a lot about that offender. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And um, Duncan, you talked about the Castleloys, New Castleloy site as well. Can you talk about the process that led up to the recent excavation of the site? Yeah. I suppose having Harry Phipps now as a suspect in Vendio or the, the most likely place that he could dispose of the children, that's what the Sahara facts. Um, what was curious is Channel 7 some years ago broadcast uh, one of the news reports that had Harry Phipps not named as a suspect, but originally then said then they named him. And the curiosity is that a bloke was sitting down having dinner, he's watching the Channel 7 news over dinner, he sees Harry Phipps in the story and he thinks to himself, and he actually says to his wife, I'm sure we dug a hole in that place all these years ago. And the guy was really credible. He's a retired engineer, um, fantastic bloke, and he was working with his brother, who's a, a very senior education bureaucrat. The two of them had a long conversation, and they were certain that it was the Australia Day long weekend in 1966 when they were asked by this local bloke, Harry Phipps, who had a factory, to go and dig a hole. The guy was particularly strange. He was tall, well-dressed, drove a Pontiac sedan, quite distinctive at the time, paid them in crisp one-pound notes, um, and was a bit, of, a bit creepy, uh, very cold. And they dug in the middle of the Castelloy site, pretty much in a sort of dark corner of it. They dug a hole, and they remembered that the hole was to be precisely, uh, precise margins, neatly dug, and the same size as the grave. They dug this hole, he paid them and they told them to take a hike. And they remember it with great clarity. So it was, they'd been to the site once before with the police for the, a dig that was done a couple of years ago. The police unfortunately didn't do their homework properly and took them to the wrong place. Um, they didn't even bother to check, not, let me be critical, get it out of the way. The police didn't even bother to check that the place, the dig site was in fact on Castleway property, it wasn't. So when Sandy and I were down there working on it with a few people. We got hold of a 1966 aerial map. Pure, pure coincidence. This beautiful photograph, I'm sorry, of the Castellois site at the time that Beaumont kids went missing. And we showed it to the fellas. Um, they both looked at it, they considered it at some point, and they went to X marks the spot. And they were quite certain. We then took them back <coughs> with the aid of the police who'd actually decided to come and have another look at this point. Um, <coughs> and narrowed down the site as to where they had dug the hole. And that's where Xanthi got involved with the experts um, and did some ground penetrating radar and other technology. And we might get Xanthi yes. to talk about the new technologies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, when I was asked, because I've got a, my first degree is in architecture, so science, and I was asked about the Castle Lloyd site, and And if we were, if there were any areas of interest, um, what we would need to do to 
to have those dates and locations. So I did some searching around and I found Dr. Ian Morgan from Flinders University. So he's a geologist with an expertise in all of the imaging techniques that are used for um, looking underneath soil, but it could be underneath, you know, through water as well. So looking um, for shipwrecks or archaeological bearings um, is one of the things that he normally does. He doesn't normally do forensic work, but we certainly need that type of expertise in this case. Then we spoke to Ian and he suggested he came to the site, had a look around, looked at the soil type, looked at the size of the area, and determined that um, electrical resistivity, which is a different type of technique to radar, would be more appropriate for that particular soil type. So ground penetrating radar can send this radar down into the earth and send back a picture um, that can be interpreted for anomalies. Now with resistivity, it now sends an electric current into the ground. And neither technique is, I would say, better than the other. They have different strengths and weaknesses depending on the soil or area that you're looking at. And the resistivity, which is the one we, we went for, allowed us to search a large area. So we did an area much larger than the actual area that these brothers have identified as of interest to see you know, what else was around there. And what came back fascinatingly was the fact that the boys were exactly right. You know, there was uh, evidence that there was an anomaly, which is all the scanning can tell us. It's not going to show up what you know, it's not CSI, but it will show us that there's something different about that area. And there was a distinct piece of ground that was about two meters long by about a meter wide, by about two meters deep, exactly where the brothers said they'd dug a hole. So this was clear evidence had in fact dug that hole in, in precisely the spot that they suggested. More importantly, it also showed that the larger area that we looked at didn't have any evidence of digging. And the resistivity allowed us to see that because when the soil has gone back into the hole, the, it captures oxygen and will actually change the, the way the current moves through that soil. So that's the way in which the technique works. Ian then interpreted that data and that's when we went forward to the flint. Uh -oh. <laughs> it's a horrible photo, but <laughs> <laughs> anyone got a phone? Let's just cut that. <laughs> oh, 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 me. Good though. Like the face that you froze on. Frozen. Oh, no. frozen. <laughs> I took a photo of it. Oh. It'll be on Twitter shortly. <laughs> Wait, I'm going to call you back. I don't know why this is <clears throat> not working. There we go. Perfect. So red now. Um, do you know where you left off, or do we want to move on? Now listen carefully, I'll say this only once. Um, <laughs> I think we've just, we just covered the, the broad area. Right, okay, so after we've covered the broad area, um, we then needed to determine whether that site of interest you know, actually represented a potential dig site. So did I explain to you about how the resistivity works? Yes. Yeah.
And then Duncan, do you just want to give us like a very brief outline of the steps after that? And then we will talk about um, the meshing of hard sciences and soft sciences. Mm. It was anticlimactic, uh, <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, Zaffy was down there on the day, I was actually avidly watching at home. Um, despite every clue, and investigation is one of my favourite phrases, investigation is literally you throw all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle on the table and you start building them in until you get to that one piece. The dig site was the final piece and it didn't fit. Um, so we don't know, the Beaumont kids oh, weren't there. Can I jump in? So Absolutely. You Right puzzle. Yes, yeah, yeah. right yeah. puzzle. Yeah. And it, it, I suppose it's in part you're getting to the head of Harry Phipps. The guy was extraordinarily bright, devious as all get out, a great manipulator. And we, we had this discussion where we actually the final people he manipulated. Yeah. Um, which also brings to the tantalizing question is if not there, then where? And that's why, I suppose, if we had our way, we'd be digging up a lot more of Castor Lloyd and upsetting the current occupants of Harry's house. We um, would. Yeah. With, and contemporary technology actually might help if the coppers want to go down that line uh, to see whether or not there are sort of forensic clues, for example, in the house to eliminate the house. Because um, it was tantalizing um, a very good bloke called Bill Hayes, who's a fantastic investigator who helped us enormously with this interviewed Harry's son, Hayden. Uh, Hayden's no longer with us, he died a couple of years ago. Um, and Hayden always kept talking about how his belief his father was responsible, some clues as to what he'd seen his father do. But he also kept referring to a hole. And just in the back of our mind, we were thinking about it, he also had the one of those of us old enough to remember how he would used to, he used to know you were doing well when you had an inspection kit for your car in the carport. So you could drive the car in and get underneath it and do an oil change. Very old fashioned Australian. And Harry had one of those in his carport. He had a big inspection kit, which was curiously enough filled in not long after. Likewise, he had a basement. Um, and there is one suggestion from the son that the children were, may have been shot inside the house. The likely location would have been the basement. Um, is there evidence of, for example, any forensic things like? ballistics evidence, blood spatter patterns, all these bizarre things that you can look into, all these bizarre things that might show up 50 odd years later, 60 odd years later almost. So, well, I, wonder, well, I wonder if they're at Castle Lloyd though, because if you were going to hide them somewhere where no one was ever going to look, say the evidence, you know, led to that hole, mm -hmm. so that's dug up, it's not there, then it's just down the track to do the time. Yep, and I suppose the point you were making when we were doing this too is someone like Harry Phipps really wanted the power of knowing where they were. Yeah. Knowing, it's that big secret, and Zappy and I talked about this at some length, is knowing Harry Phipps having this secret. Because Harry Phipps had a few secrets he used to. He, was, uh, he had a, an absolute obsession for satin and would dress himself up in clothes that he'd make himself. Um, we tracked him down to um, a club in Adelaide where certain members of the Adelaide establishment would gather once a month for a Saturday night and they'd cross-dress. It wasn't that uncommon in the period. So Harry was a man who kept this second life very, very secret. So knowing where his three kids were buried would give him, I think, an enormous amount of pleasure, a little secret knowledge. Um, it's not uncommon with killers like Harry. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think he would have wanted to keep them close for security reasons. Mm. On his own side, then no one's going to be digging up Sitting in that house overlooking the beach and watching the flurry of activity 
ground and hundreds of coppers, helicopters, boats, emergency services. They drained just adjacent to Harry's house is this gigantic swamp. It's called the Patalawaza Swamp, which is just basically a bloody great lake. And the coppers actually drained the lake and went through it foot by foot by foot uh, within about a week of it happening. So Harry's sitting there watching all this and we were quite excited by it. So I'm going yeah, to... I'm going to cut in there um, so we can continue to move on. Xanthi, you said before that this investigation um, bridged the hard sciences and soft sciences, um, to use colloquial terms. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, well, a lot of the work that we were doing from a criminological investigative point of view is very much kind of the, what would be classed as the soft on science. Um, and this is those, you know, those trails that you follow, those people that you talk to, those maps that you find for everything that was a real, you know, real gift to the investigation. Um, that was bridged the hard sciences of what Ian Moffat could offer in terms of the uh, geology of the area, the new techniques for imaging of the ground that weren't available a few years ago. So remember the gift that was in the wrong place a few years ago. Had they used that they used ground penetrating radar then, the outlets of the soil is very similar, so they wouldn't have found the right area anyway because the techniques available at the time wouldn't have answered the questions that they were asking. So it was very much a marriage of that investigation, criminological, sociological interpretation of the victims, the scene, the offender, married with those advances, which is very recent, you know, the, the digital information used in the forensic capacity report. So this was really groundbreaking in a number of ways where we married these together and took the, the information to the police. So it was bringing together all of those different elements um, or adding something to this puzzle that without any of those, we wouldn't have been able to progress the investigation at all. Yeah, and so we'll continue on with um, talking about the sociology and um, bringing in Ben here. So Ben, we've previously talked about this case as fundamentally questioning, challenging the nature of childhood. And you've said to me before that it serves as a culturally significant moment at which the popular notions of innocence in childhood changed in Australian culture. And Duncan, we've talked about this as well when, we've, when we had the meeting for this. Um, so Ben, as a youth sociologist and as a youth worker, I wonder if you can expand on the nature of childhood in this case and the importance um, of that. Yeah, can I pick up? <clears throat> so I think one of the things that um, certainly stands out to me, but maybe also just to the modern mind, is in this case is the supervision of the children. So they went to the beach by themselves and for children at that age to do that today is almost fairly unthinkable. Expect that to be standard for parenting practice. Practice, and so the the narrative that surrounds that within for example the documentary that came out earlier this year is uh, that there was during an age of innocence for these children, uh, so the children could wander in in the community and that was fairly acceptable. Um, and then after these kind of incidents, and I believe there's another similar kind of incident that happened um, was it in Sydney with a young boy as well who disappeared around the same time. That was fairly uh, big in the media space. Graham Thorpe. That's the one. Thank you very much. Um, so those sort of instances supposedly changed the nature of, of childhood in Australia, um, or at least changed the way that we think about it. And I find that really interesting um, because it, for me it speaks to more than just parenting practices, but what happens in the culture at the time, and, and even say the geography. So you just just yesterday. Uh, I went back to the, the street where the Beaumonts live just to observe the, the space that's there. Uh, and you can be sitting there and you can see there's a mixture of sort of the houses that were built around the time and some new developments. And the, the suburb itself is kind of located between these, these major arterial roads, but in, within the suburb it's quite quiet. And there's, uh, houses have low fences and so you can see into them imagine children playing in that space during that time it, and almost strangely as I was sitting there for just a couple of minutes these two young boys scooted by uh, with their dog uh, without any parents and they're probably around 10 years of age and almost reinforcing that this is a, a safe space for children to play uh, and so the idea that that um, changed is interesting because it says there are other dynamics that suggest perhaps 
rather than that being a time of innocence and we're moving into a time where the child has lost that, perhaps it's actually almost the reverse. You know, perhaps childhood has become increasingly innocent or this idea that we are supposed to have innocence in childhood is, is now increasingly being protected by adults. So for example, you know, you've got parents around that time who have lived through uh, World War II and the Depression and what they're trying to do is carve out this space for their children to have this innocent childhood and so they're becoming more protective. And there are other social dynamics like um, the introduction of cars. So uh, around that time, there's some stats that say, you know, something like one in 10 people owned a car. Uh, and so the street is a relatively safe place because these cars are slow moving and there's not many of them. Um, fast forward 34 years and cars are much more prevalent, they go a lot faster. And so we can't play in the street in the same way and the same level of safety. And the other dynamic I was thinking about that you mentioned earlier was these, uh, lots of people identified with children on the day. You know, it was the postie, the shopkeeper, uh, the bus driver. All these people knew the children. And they were supervised, maybe not necessarily by a parent, but certainly by the community. So it's interesting to sort of interrogate some of the dynamics that change around parenting practices um, and the use of public space. And I think, yeah, I would almost invert that narrative and say, you know, childhood has increasingly become this innocent space because it's increasingly protected. Um, yeah. And do you think one of the, that's one of the reasons why this case, aside from the fact that we still haven't found it, is so compelling and people grip onto it so fiercely? Yeah, because they, they identify with the desire to protect children, I suppose, in, in that way. Um, and also I think people have that nostalgic memory of a time when people played in the street and the, the desire for that community um, that exists around people like that. There's been other little bit of interesting research that asked the question whether um, people stopped playing in the street because it was no longer safe, or is it because people stopped playing in the street that it's no longer safe? And the idea that children actually play a really important part in building community in a street in a suburb like that. Um, there's this nostalgic desire for that era of things. Yeah. And Duncan, I wonder if you can add to that and talk about why the case is still so compelling for people in relation to crime and, and criminality. Mm, it's a whole sort of a mix of reasons. One thing that I would always forget, so I'll do it first, it's the first time in Australia that the media are actually on site broadcasting. What we went from to 1966, it was the first outside broadcast anywhere. So it's all of a sudden, all of Australia could watch the action in Adelaide unfolding as it happened. And it was a huge event. So it's imprinted in our psyche. One, because we saw the pictures. It was carried by every newspaper in Australia at the time it went overseas. So there's that line of the sand there in our minds that all of a sudden, for the first time ever, we're actually part of it. We can see what the police are doing. We can see the families. We're seeing the interviews. So it becomes real for us in that first instance. Secondly, the bizarre nature of the crime. Um, on Australia Day, three kids at the beach like thousands and thousands of other kids, they disappeared, never seen again. Parents' worst possible nightmare. You can't even conceive of what those parents went through that day. So there's a lot of reflection on that. From that, I'm the same age as Jack Beaumont. So I keep thinking, okay, when I was making this, I keep thinking, what were they doing in 1966 on that day? Pretty much what they were doing, walking across the road to the beach. That's all I was doing. I was about eight or nine or whatever. So there's that memory for a lot of us there. The reason so many of these cold cases attract interest, um, <coughs> thank goodness that they do, is because it's a mystery unsolved. People want resolution. I'm not a huge fan of the word closure because I don't think you're ever going to close down something like this. But what it will do is bring finality to the parents, the families, the friends, and in many cases too, the emergency service people, the coppers who handle these cases, are forever lost in matters who was weird to be 85 years old and still actively helping the case that he, I think he was 25 or 26 when it happened, he's 85 now and he was devastated when we didn't find him. He was with us every step of the way to help. So it's important for these people that we get that resolution. 
that the case, the mystery is solved, brings that finality. You'll never get over it, but at least you're not guessing anymore. You're not hoping, you're not wishing. You don't wake up in the morning thinking, where the hell are they? You know what's happened, it's resolved. The other thing, of course, that I, I bang my head around occasionally is too, <coughs> if you don't take an interest in these cases, if you don't keep pushing, if you don't take it to the public, because the public will help you solve it, they have the knowledge you don't. I don't know. But someone out there may finally start talking, or that little snippet of information comes back and you think, this is a new path for us to go down. Because somewhere out there, there's a murderer. The murderer of the Beaumont boys, we think is Harry Phipps, and Harry died of natural causes. But there are so many other cases that are this old and perhaps more recent. Uh, the murderer is still working, walking around free. It's just not acceptable, I'm sorry. That is the, I remember I chased, years ago, when I was at the ABC, we chased a war criminal called Conrad Calais, a Nazi responsible for deaths of hundreds of people. And I remember getting a lot of flack saying, oh, but he's old, why is he doing this? Well, he's old, he's a murderer, he's an apathurigoing bastard, so why shouldn't he? Why should he go quietly into the night? I think society, well, I should say this, society expects us to do this, this job. Um, there's not much point having a court for justice if you're not going to use it. So this is why these people need to be fixed up. So on that, can you talk about the ethics of looking at cold cases from a journalistic perspective? Yeah, it's the curiosity is that when you deal with these cold cases, um, off the top of the head, you know, one in 10 will ever get to the press for us, but we'll do a lot of work, as Anthony and I have done a lot of work on cases that will never see the light of day in the media uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, but you do them anyway because you can actually help them with what you do. And it helps the family. It can nudge the police into action. Sometimes the coppers can be a bit hard to budge. Sometimes they're great. Um, nothing gets the police moving fast at the front page of a newspaper. Guarantee you speak. Um, but in most cases, sorry, in a lot of cases, you'll deal with families and people involved. Some of them will actually come to you for that assistance because they know that you're pretty much the last resort. They're not getting any satisfaction or support anywhere else. Their case is gathered in dust in a gigantic backlog. So let's see if we can move it up a bit. Um, and in many cases too, if the families haven't come to you, go and see them and you can judge. And I've, God, so few people ever say, no, I'm not interested. They want that resolution. I spent Sunday morning uh, at Long Bay Jail interviewing Roger Rogerson. He invited me out for a chat because he scared the hell out of both of them. Um, and when I got home, one of the, uh, Roger has a lot of victims. Um, and, <coughs> The daughter of one of them rang me and she said, how did it go? Because I told her I was going as a, as a courtesy. I said, um, you know, he, he wants to talk about his appeal. And all she wanted to know was what I thought his chances of appeal were. And I said, look, they're about 10% at best. And she said, do you think we can nail it down to zero? Mm -hmm. And this is a woman whose mother died 35 years ago. So that gives you, this is what we do. This is why people want that finality. They want to know that They've exhausted all opportunities to resolve the case. Um, so if we can give them a bit of certainty, fantastic, that's what we're here for. And Zancy, do you want to comment on that? Um, and in relation to teaching as well, because you use um, often these cases, you draw upon them in your lectures and tutorials and that sort of thing. Yeah. You know, I think it's really important as well, because a lot of the time that we'll look at these cases, I mean, if I mention Ivan Malacky, Um, experience for them where they can almost let it go. You know, 
you know, because they're seeing so much in the media, and I think it's a massive place like Beaumont, and you're watching that as somebody who knew the Beaumonts or one of their family, and you're hearing other people's interpretation of your story. So having that voice yourself, which the media can give to some of these victims and their families, it's really incredibly powerful on a personal level for a lot of these people. So we do get criticised for telling these stories, but I think without that kind of background and understanding of why we do it and, and the help it can bring to the victims and their families, even if the case is never solved, just to share their moment with the world and have you know, their voice is really incredibly powerful. And that's really important to me in my teaching as well, because broadening the student's mind is not just about the offenders they'll have heard of, it's not just about the fact that it's an amazing story that captured the world, it's about the people, it's about the victims and what bringing closure or at least some portion of that can mean to them as people. So really important I think that students recognise the humanity in a lot of the things that we do. That's certainly what drives me to do it um, and I know Duncan feels the same, it's about that humanity element and that's why police do it and most of the people I know they're great people can I add something yeah. as well? Because I think the um, the dynamic of the media, as I think you said, is the first time it's been kind of broadcast to the same level. Um, is a really interesting social dynamic, and it certainly plays into I think um, some of the changes or that again the age of innocence. That there's an increasing accessibility of this kind of knowledge in the public space, and an increasing awareness of the risks to um, to children or to other people. You know, as, as the, the prevalence, what I suppose I'm saying is not necessarily that the prevalence of crime has changed, but the awareness of it has changed, and that influences people's behaviour. Um, so I think, uh, as I reflect on that as a youth sociologist and as a youth worker, part of the value of continuing to talk about or to learn from these kind of cases uh, and having them in the media is an opportunity to inform practice as youth workers, and but also to change our perceptions about um, the type of perpetrators that might be involved in this um, kind of activity. I think one of the, the things, again, from the documentary, maybe you can do the interview a little bit, but that Harry Phipps wasn't originally on the radar as a suspect because he didn't fit the profile of the expected perpetrator at the time. He was expected somebody who was essentially the cliched image of a pedophile, yep. um, not somebody who was uh, you know, powerful, charismatic, uh, well-dressed. So that kind of change in the understanding of the nature of who's involved in these kind of crimes is an important learn from this, I think. Um, but the, the flip side of that, uh, in some ways, is I could make the argument uh, that it has the effect of um, changing the way that we think about young people and children for the negative. That we might push them back into that, that phase of innocence rather than seeing them as capable because we are more scared of the kind of thing that can happen to them. So that, that's yeah, a flip side of maybe a negative to that heightened media exposure as well. And so Ben, um, we'll stick with you for a second. <coughs> what can the, or what do you see the social sciences contributing to true crime? Okay. So the thing I think that I'm interested in uh, is the, question, the broader questions about how do we get here and what are the, the implications of these cases? So what are the, the social context, cultural context that lead up to these sort of crimes, and then what are the results of them? So that's why I'm interested in things like media and the discourses around youth and childhood. So what are the effects? Um, and then, then also, as a youth worker, what are the practices? You know, what are the things that we should then do with that information? How do we, how does that inform what our next step is? How do we stop this from happening again? So that's kind of my interest uh, as a social scientist. Yeah. And what about yourself, Sanity? Well, I think it's the flow on that I think is really interesting. So if you look at something like the Deep Tech, okay, so it's about uh, now a very well-known potential crime, at least the disappearance of Lynn Dawson, looking at Chris Dawson as the potential suspect. But it's also about the culture. So we've got investigative journalists looking at the culture in the schools that allowed, allegedly, Chris Dawson and others to groom schoolgirls. So it's about that, that nature of innocence and childhood how this could, this whole area or this whole school kind of system could actually breed this, this type of behaviour in a group of males and then they're being investigated now historically. So that, you know, I regard investigative journalism as a type of uh, sociology, you know, one of the social sciences, you know, bringing those knowledge to, to 
I agree with Sansi. I think it's. I, I wrote a book a couple of years ago about the gay voters in Sydney, and I think particularly I'm just just listening to what you're saying, it's it happened at a remarkable time, but we have to look at the factors as to why it happened. It happened because of political pressure. It happened because of the arrival of HIV. It happened because of attitudes in the New South Wales police force. It happened because of the attitudes of certain people in New South Wales Parliament. This horrible confluence happens, and one of the results of that is that a group of youth thought that gay men were an easy target because one, they knew where they congregated, two, they knew they were somewhat socially isolated, and three, they knew the coppers may or may not be that interested in vigorously pursuing them. Fabulous, let's try them. Typical target for a predatorial group more than anything else. So I think we learn so much from those periods. We also learn just from an investigative point of view how to do things better. Um, how to use contemporary technology, uh, how, contemporary, how contemporary technology can actually be taken back to an older case and get a result. Then Zanthi and I talk some of what about the capacity to use modern technology on cases that are 20 or 30 years old. We've only had DNA in investigations around since the very late 80s when it started. So that's a whole brand new world for us to go and look at. And for me, if we use a combination of these things, and put some light on these old cases, it might just shake something loose to bring them to an end. And, you know, that's, that's, it's a fair and just thing for everybody, not just the victims, the victims, their families, their friends, and so on. Everyone benefits by these things, by resolving these old cases. I go back to what I've always said, if some bastard's walking around free when they should be in jail, let's see what we can do to get them behind bars. And Duncan, where to now with the Beaumonts? <laughs> could I ask that? Could I not ask that? Oh, you could ask it. <laughs> Remember that we can see you, Sandy. <laughs> a big nudge to the South Australian... Look, I think, let it... Let the South Australian police cogitate over what they've been given. Um, they learned a lot from this experience with us as well. They finally got themselves a bloody good suspect for the Beaumonts. Uh, hopefully they'll feel more motivated to look into Harry's other potential sites, the house, the rest of Cars Deloitte, and get really serious about it and resolve this mystery. Maybe that's what it'd be like. And maybe, just maybe, with all the publicity it's got lately, maybe someone might have seen something. Uh, a lot of them won't be upright anymore, but it only takes one. So you sort of, people like, we're eternal optimists. We may see the worst in life, but we also expect the best sometimes as well, which would be someone coming forward and say, hey, I remembered something. And as we found out when we were doing this, um, Harry's victims that survived came forward. So Harry went from being a bloke who was a pillar of the community, suspected of being the Beaumont's murder for a lot of reasons, to a man we actually now can prove was a sexual predator. Um, with people who have come forward, they're credible, they're honourable, they tell a story of an absolutely horrid human being. So we didn't know this before we did this program. We surmised, but <laughs> no, now we have facts. The coppers have now got much more to go on than they did before, so hopefully they'll dig out the equipment and go and have another look. So, um, before we open up to questions, both from the live stream and from the audience, is there anything that the panel would like to add to finish off? Well, I think I'll just, just follow just very quickly what Duncan just said. I think that is.
feel that Neil's out of the stage. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Yep. Yeah. Um, with Harry, he wouldn't have been able to travel that far to get the vehicle he had in Marine, the avenue up through past the Roy through Ball Ocean. So he would have been the same, but he had easy access from going home to past the Roy. Now, whether he does that drive as a decoy initially, I thought he had, but I think he possibly was going to bury those mm -hmm. children there. Then he had second thoughts, and the castle always got furnaces. Has the police yeah. ever done forensic analysis? Because those furnaces would have been built up over the years because you have to build the furnace up. They, they've done absolutely Have they nothing. done any <coughs> forensic analysis in that area? No, I don't think I'd be too unkind suggesting they had to be not dragged, but certainly nudged firmly to get it. Yeah, product, yes, that's more polite. Well, the only place he could go was from home, because that vehicle he had, um, um, I'll tell you a story later, but it used to happen around our area, and he was a typical employee. He was probably that person. Why do you need to go to your basement? Just in case. <laughs> well, yeah. well, no one can establish where in the house. If something happened in the house, no one knows where it happened. I'm old fashioned, I take a police work. When you go to search a room, you will start at the roof and you'll work down to the floorboard so you won't miss anything. The house is exactly the same. The basement could be somewhere interesting. The attic could be somewhere interesting. Start from the top, but work all the way down. That way you won't miss anything. There's, uh, there's a story about a white person in that basement. Is that mythology? No. No, I, good point. It's not. Um, I've interviewed his aunt, he's interviewed the bloke who found him. Um, he didn't make anything up. He, it's, it's a bizarre story. Jane Beaumont, just to quickly go through it, Jane Beaumont had a little white purse um, the day she left home. Years and years later, a bloke called Stuart Mullins, who's uh, the fellow who actually started work on how he fixed the app, a gifted amateur uh, who just doesn't give up. He inveigled his way into Shea Phipps after Harry died, started talking to Harry's second wife. Uh, she gave him the guide and tour of the house. Downstairs in the basement, they're wandering through. He sees the purse. It tweaks with him a little bit, but not enough because he doesn't know enough about the case. He gets upstairs, goes back to the hotel where it was, rings his mate who's writing about the case, who knows it backwards, and says, oh, I've seen this in the basement. The guy goes, bang. Stuart goes back a day or two later. Um, doesn't quite get the warm reception he had, had the last time, uh, and the purse is gone. Mrs. Phipps says to him, because he asked him what happened to him, he said, I bought that at an op shop and just put it in the basement a couple of weeks ago. We should add that he is a millionaire having um, inherited Fitz's estate. Yes. So, you know, I'm not saying she wouldn't go in an op shop, but why would you go and buy a child's purse yeah. in an op shop? It was, the whole thing was just really weird. Um, yeah. Op shop, cheap purse, put it in the basement, give me a break. And the, uh, the other thing about it, and this is, this is why the observations are so important when you're doing this sort of work, is that the basement also had lots of Harry's memorabilia, suitcases. Harry was a bit of a hoarder, but everything was meticulously lined up and kept beautifully. And the purse is sitting there amongst this beautifully, beautifully placed Amazing. stuff. Yeah, it wasn't a basement like my place. It would be my place to go to the basement <laughs> if I had one, and you'd fall over and break your neck. This place was laid out methodically, and the purse was in the right spot. So it was in place rather than looking out of place. And Stuart just noticed it. Other questions? Um, there is a lot of um, mystery, obviously, surrounding this case, and I think people feel uh, a sense of great mystery when they think about it, and often overlook the brutality that this is, in fact, a sex crime. Mm. Is that how we should understand it? And does it help to understand it as a sex crime? Um, sorry, shall I jump in? Uh, until we know what happens, so we can't confirm who the offender may be. 
our assumption is that there's a sexual element to the crime and that one or other of the children were the target of this particular offender. Um, I just would argue though that a sex crime is still a crime of power and control. So whoever took the children may have had sexual inclination to children. However, it, for me, this crime speaks of dominant power over somebody um, weaker. So it may be a sex crime, but we still have the elements of power that are essential here. Yeah, yeah, I suppose to Harry's victims, as we learned about, we learned more about Harry's victims, particularly as people came forward. Um, there is a great diversity from potentially kids four or five years old through to women in a couple of cases in their early 30s. So I agree with Xanthi. For Harry, it's all about that. I don't view him in the terms of it. It's the game Harry plays. He likes, he's just, it's all about control, it's about domination. And he's a classic predator. He hunts not because he has a specific target, he hunts because he wants to get the pleasure out of catching them and have, doing what he wants, controlling them. And that's and the ultimate Harry. power is alive and death. Yeah. Do you think the predation that day was purely opportunistic? Probably. I think uh, from the, where the kids were, um, it's a reasonable chance. And, you know, people like that too. And I, Zappi and I were looking at a serial killer recently. And it's a bit like they hit upon a few and they'll get a target. They know what they're looking for. These people are incredibly skilled. So I suppose three innocent kids on a beach that day. He had the right pitch, he had the right look. He wasn't wearing a plastic raincoat. He was a very presentable. You know, back in those days, we always watched out for dirty old men. I didn't see any. Harry was the exact opposite. He was absolutely pristine. Um, so yeah, I think, I, think, I think in his case, it was just all about this game he played. His satisfaction was, I mean, the allegations that he abused his male children allegations that he'd been abused a 16 year old girl, middle aged women came forward. The guy was just, it was all about Harry's game. <coughs> That's all he wants. Yeah, I would agree. I think it was opportunistic in that he wasn't targeting these three specific children because they weren't, you know, being stalked or whatever. But I think he was possibly out on the hunt and they represented, yeah, an opportunity to fulfill his so, particular fantasy. Yeah, and God, there was this, the, the Possibility there was this good Samaritan routine that he played where the kids have lost their money. The nice bloke comes up and says, Oh, isn't that terrible? I'll look after you. The kids are already feeling quite disturbed, off centre, quite needy. That barrier is broken down. So when a Samaritan comes up, you know, we all still think the best of people. So Harry comes up to help them. The fact that Harry probably stole the money deliberately to set the situation up is a totally different thing. So he lures them in, that's his trap. And it works beautifully. And you know, you get that, I mean, you've seen them operate. There's a moment where the eye contact happens and he knows you're over that first barrier. And rather than stand back, the kids come towards you. You do it when you're interviewing people. You know when you're doing an interview with somebody how it's going to go when the person starts leaning forward and paying attention. Yeah. And you know you've got it. And that's not dissimilar to the way these characters operate. Um, do you think there's a risk with this style of journalism that it trains the community and children to look for the wrong kind of danger? Because these guys, these successful cold cases, they're the rock stars, the superheroes who've been able to get away with it. Whereas the real danger is the neighbour, the person they know, um. the relative, who accounts has got a much, much more life damage and, and lots more bodies accounted for. Yeah, to, well, these cases might be the rock star, but this case is one of many we've done. Um, I think, certainly in the stuff that Anthony and I did, there's this broad sweep of anything from the intimacy of the story, one of our early ones we did, about a small girl, 11 years old, murdered by her sister's boyfriend. Um, and it was legally incredibly important case because there's a lot of issues at play, double jeopardy of course and all this sort of jazz. But you can take that one small issue and build it up. So 
I don't think the rock star case is dominant. I think they draw people into the genre, perhaps. But you know, we, do, we deal with a broad canvas of cases from those very small, very intimate, to something very, very grand, like the, the size of the Beaumont. So um, I don't think they overwhelm. I think the lessons come from each case. And for us, it's how you tell the story. Because the lesson was, lesson's a bad term. But how you tell that story is what gets people in. Um, you might be brought to tears after the first 10 seconds of the Beaumont's after the promo and think, oh, I can't be bothered. So you actually have to tell a story and bring those issues into it. So cases like this don't overwhelm the audience. Um, with e each story's got different facets. Each story has important facets. So it's how you tell the story that will have the impact on you more than the bells and whistles on the familiarity of the case. I think that's something we have to place the story in context, tell the broad story, tell the human experiences, tell the resolution. Um, I don't think bells and whistles or something like the Beaumonts will overwhelm people because we tell so many stories and each story has to be told so well so I don't, I don't think so. I think there's a really important point in your question uh, which is that most violent abuse happens in the home from people who are familiar and so I don't know if I would want to go down as far as saying we shouldn't pay as much attention to these ones but I think giving more attention to uh, the more regular violence that happens in domestic violence space would be really good. Um, so for that bit, I, I would agree with you. I think there was, I was driving to work yesterday <coughs> and um, they were reporting on this recent uh, case in Perth uh, where there was the, the tragic murder of uh, a young family. Um, and they said it was like maybe 8.30 in the morning mm -hmm. and were, the reporters mentioned a counter which was on the ABC website which says how many domestic violence incidents the police have responded to that day. Mm. 8 in the morning it was already over 100. So the, there is a really important point about what is the regularity or, or where, where else should we be putting our attention? Well, well we've had the problem with nephews come, they country kids, they come to the city. What, what, we, we quiz them, what's dangerous in the city, right? And, oh, it's bombs, it's terrorists, right? <laughs> that you can get, get them to pay attention crossing the road. <laughs> right? That's not restricted to country people coming to the city. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so I think that, that um, uh, yes, there are bad people out there, right? Um, but I don't know. Let's go up the back. Amelia had a question. Um, if a panel can comment, what is the Beaumont's current attitude? But Duncan, when you said that he is still close to the area, and you said that you're still waiting for the kids to come home, has he accepted that the kids are more than likely to come to foul play? Or oh, yeah. If, I think so. What's his current attitude? Mr. Beaumont, well, Mr. Beaumont is about 93 or 94. Yeah. Um, Look, I think they still entertain that one glimmer of hope that the kids would come home, but they're resigned to the fact that they're dead years ago. But you know, you, you never, you never give up that one little shred. And that's why these things are so important that it will linger until they're found. So he doesn't talk about it very often. I spoke to a, an old mate of mine, Adelaide, who'd known him for years and years and years, and they'd take him to the football every weekend. 20 odd years, and he didn't mention his kids once. And they didn't ask him either. But uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Andrew Taylor, I think he, Mr. Beaumont, is being looked after the, by the police, kept abreast of what's happening. And still, just want the, there's that one sliver of hope that they'll either be found and it can be resolved. But yeah, resign, resign to what happened years ago. Do you think that they will resign to at all push the police forward to say that? It'd be lovely to think it that Bertson gets yeah. a resolution. And uh, more so, poor old Mosty Matt is a detective who's been doing it since the day one. Mosty was absolutely horrified when he had the result. Just devastated. Uh, because he believed for years that Harry Phipps was the bloke, the spot was there. Um, and for a stoic old detective, he was bloody sad to see. But at the same time, he then pops up and comes out fighting and says, where are we going to dig next? So it's that sort of spirit. I think what's 
really important about these sorts of cases is that they start to change society's views about um, sort of real things that happen. So you've talked about childhood innocence and cases like this start to change society's view about is it safe for children. Uh, the topic that I think is becoming increasingly um, sort of top of mind is female sexual abusers of children. So a sort of truth accepted until pretty recently is that pedophiles tend to be men and that's starting to change with cases coming out. What other sort of trends are you seeing in this space of things that hitherto haven't been really considered? Um, certainly the female sex offenders is certainly coming out is one of them. So I would still say predominantly um, the majority of predators seem to be male. However, the market of trends is female. Um, and we're beginning to accept that female do commit different types of crimes that before were very, um, very untenable. But so the, the issue of gender is growing. I do think in this case we're looking for a male offender, but certainly not discounting females anymore when you know when they are sex offences against children. So that's an area um, as well as domestic violence and violence and um, dual domestic violence within relationships is something I think that is, is kind of growing interest as well. So the gender crimes are, are really an area that is blossoming at the moment. Blossoming's probably not the best yeah. word. <laughs> <laughs> blossoming um. interest in uh, gender based crimes. Perfect. Um, but maybe <laughs> add something that I'm interested in, but I'm not sure that it's uh, getting public interest. Uh, it's, the thing I find interesting is we individualise these sort of violent crimes. You know, we look at um, who's the person to blame, and whether it be their gender or their social economic status or something like that. But I'm, I'm interested in our broad culture, cultural understanding, and stories and narratives about violence. What do we talk about? What do we teach each other about through our um, popular media, through our our storytelling like films and books and the, the idea of, of violence as a problem solving technique is actually very strongly part of our culture and it's quite a difficult thing to challenge and I'm, I'm not going to suggest you know, now that we have to throw it away altogether that there are certainly people who think we should but even if you go back to um, child childhood stories you know even uh, kids cartoons the idea that we solve problems through violence is actually there. It's in childhood cartoons. So we want to ask questions about who commits violence. But then we have to go back and ask, well, how do we teach people how to solve problems from a very early age? So that's what I'm interested in. Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was just going to say, I'm assuming they have the DNA of Mr. and Mrs. Bernard? They certainly do. <laughs> we checked with them as well. Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. One of, part of this game is you never leave anything to chance, just in case. And uh, unfortunately, harsh experience suggests that some people do leave something to chance. So we're, we're the pedantic boys of this world. Have you done this? Have you done that? Have you done that? Uh, I think it was the first email, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. 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 Were, just were they in case. ever able to get DNA from belongings of children like hair, well, brushes, and things? It didn't exist then. No. But if you had a purse, <laughs> you had a little white purse there. Yeah. Oh. Mm. If we had a purse, we would be able to determine, hopefully, if that was James um, by DNA that may be left on it, depending on the storage. But even if it's two years later, it's possible we could have got viable DNA that we could then match the parents. Yeah. Can I just interject here as well? There's been a question that's came through a couple of times online. Um, both on the live stream and we opened up an online form before this, is could they still be alive? Oh, it's possible. Um, we can't rule it out until we found them, but everything speaks to the fact that they're no longer alive, but they were still probably that day within around, I would estimate around three hours, yeah. looking at other crimes um, that we see with child abduction when they're found deceased or not found at all. So I would think it's highly unlikely, but we cannot rule it out until they've been found. I'm with you. I'm about 99% certain they are. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But, you know. Never say never. Exactly. Dr. Newman, you mentioned that the Dean Company hasn't been quite what you said about the family. Is that what you said? Oh, sorry, the family. I, yeah, I've never heard of Oh, an old Adelaide institution. It's fascinating. Uh, yes. <laughs> it's interesting when you go to Adelaide, some people will deny that they ever existed, and other people will say, of course they existed. 
and it's bizarre. It's sort of mad life, sorry. Um, <laughs> the, the, in the late 70s and early 80s, there was allegedly a group of um, middle-aged gay men who preyed on younger men. Not uncommon, not uncommon. But it, these guys went far, far beyond that. Um, and there were all sorts of bizarre stories about young men making sex work and that thing just disappearing. The people, the itinerant sex workers and so on, people without connections or people whose connections have been pretty much diluted socially, um, disappeared and horrible things happened, basically. Um, it was given some breath by the disappearance in, whenever it was, 1980s, early 80s, of a guy called um, Kelvin. Local channel, I think Channel 9 or Channel 7 news reader, Rob Kelvin, his son disappeared and was found just an appalling murder, a really utterly appalling. Um, the guy who was arrested for it was Bevan Spencer von Heinem, who's still at the clink. And he denied, and he's, von Heinem is just curious, I'll be very quick about it. Von Heinem was probably on the bridge at the Patil of the swamp when they were draining it to find the Beaumont kids. Uh, it was bizarre. Bevan von Heinem, <coughs> lovely piece of history. In about 1972, a guy called George Duncan was drowned in the Torrent River. He was down there sort of wandering around seeing if he'd find a bit of companionship that night. Members of the South Australian Vice Squad thought it was appropriate to throw him in the river, uh, and his mate, they threw both of them in the river. One bloke got out, George Duncan couldn't swim, and he drowned. It caused a lot of kerfuffle in South Australia when they really realised who the culprits probably were. His mate is crawling out, somewhat beaten and bruised from the Torrent, and a good Samaritan comes, picks him up and takes him to Adelaide Hospital. The good Samaritan was Bevan Spencer von Einem. I know he fell off my chair when I heard him. But von Einem was is the ugly face of what the family was, the abductor, the seducer, um, and in many cases they believed the murderer. They thought he was good for about three or four, but in that great Adelaide way, oh, it's only the tip of the iceberg. So it's, but it's, it's the shadows of Adelaide back in the 70s and 80s. There is a book written about it, but curiously enough, when you go to talk to the author, he won't say a word to you. It's, it's weird. I don't know whether it's true, but there is certainly a strong suggestion that it was. Good research project, by the way. Is there any association with tips or anything? Um, a high probability that tips was associated with people who may have been part of the family. It's that Adelaide society thing at that time, terribly, terribly cloistered, affluent, politically astute and influential. Real chance. Um, particularly as Harry used to frock up on a Saturday night and go down and see them. It's, it was a very interesting world. Mm. Any last questions, Jeff? Just about how unusual you said the crime was. Um, does in a criminal profiling type of perspective, do you believe that this or whoever it was, was after one child and took all three for ease? Or do you believe that you won all three? Well, three would be tough. However, if you're going to abduct a child, abducting three children together, if you can um, gain the attention and um, win over the eldest, Jane, and marry the responsible nine-year-old, then it may actually be easier. If, imagine all those children at the beach will be an adult. That could be really difficult. So. I don't know whether they went for three or whether this was an opportunity that they saw that they got Jane on side and suddenly, you know, they've got these three potential children. There's some suggestion in that actually Grant, the four year old male, was the main target, but obviously that's speculation until we know more about the offender and again, if we find the children, figure out who the offender was and what their motivation was, it's going to be virtually impossible. But um, I think they just represented an opportunity and possibly if this was a control based crime, you know, taking three, <coughs> it would be difficult to take one. I suppose to just, for someone like Phipps, who's obviously a complete control freak, three is extraordinary. Right? Right. But if you're talking about issues of power and control as well, especially. He just, he just climbed Everest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And got, three, away, and got yes, away with yeah. it. Got away with it. All right, well, we might end it there. Thank you, Xanthony, for um, FaceTiming in from the UK. Thank you, Ben, for coming from Adelaide. And thank you, Duncan. Coming from Darlinghurst. Coming from Darlinghurst. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Very much.